I have a very simple thesis, which may not be popular, but is nonetheless true. Coding assistants accelerate your development practices, whether they are good or bad. In other words, you are tying a giant rocket engine to whatever engineering infrastructure practices you have, and you're saying, go, just go, go faster, go do more. You know what? If you have any kind of weakness in your engineering infrastructure layer, your best practices layer, that choice to add Claude code, to add Codex, which just updated this week, that's going to end up being net negative. Yeah, I said it. It's going to end up being net negative. I don't want that for you because there are teams that are getting real gains. There was a viral post recently on Reddit called, this is how we vibe coded a fang. You know what it was about? It wasn't about a vibe coding tool set that would magically fix everything. It was about the engineering infrastructure decisions that matter. And I want to focus on that today because, you know, we could take this time and we could dive into why Codex is the best thing since sliced bread. Because Codex is at the top of the news this week. And that's all anyone can talk about if they're in development is like, do we use Codex? Do we use Claude Code? You are asking the wrong question. In most cases, the right question is at the engineering infrastructure layer. And you only get to the tool choice if you've asked the right engineering infrastructure questions. So I want to give you in this conversation the specific questions you should be asking yourself as a technical leader, as a technical team member, as a builder, as a coder, as a vibe coder, before you pick a tool. Ask yourself these first, because then when you use the tool, you'll be able to go actually faster and not slower. Question number one, what is the problem that we are solving specifically? Almost no one can answer this, actually. Just try answering it. Is it speeding up boilerplate code? Is it onboarding juniors? Is it reducing bugs in repetitive tasks or something else? If you have a vague goal, like we're going to boost the productivity of our engineering team, I'm sorry, you've been sitting in the C-suite too long. Like I need some specifics here. I need you to say specifically, this is the expectation that we have for what this tool will do for our engineers and why. Or if I'm a builder individually, this is what it will do for me and why. Maybe it's as simple as you know, I'm a builder and using Devon or using Claude code, I'm going to get time back. I can be in a meeting and the thing can be building anyway. Okay, that's fair. That's a specific goal. You can talk about optimizing for that goal and what the tools and all of that. But if you don't have specific problems you're trying to solve, specific goals that you're setting, you are already off in the wrong direction. And I find that the bigger the company, the harder this is to do. Larger companies with larger teams often have real trouble saying what is the specific problem that they're driving at, and it takes a lot of work to peel the onion and get there, but you need to. Question two, do we have strong engineering practices already that are worth amplifying? Look at the prereqs. Do you have consistent code patterns across your code base? Do you have date documents that are up to date? Do you have actual review culture and rigorous PR reviews? Do you have design docs that you're proud of and you can stand behind? If you don't, it is likely that whatever agent you pick, whatever tool you pick, AI is going to make whatever you're doing worse. You need to take the time to try to get your house in order so that what you select has a foundation to build on. AI is surprisingly fragile in that regard. It's amazing at so many things, but it does need you to be disciplined. It needs you to have good engineering practices for it to ladder in as infrastructure in a supportive way. And so many houses don't. And again, this becomes something that is big company challenging. If you're a small coder on your own, you can say, yeah, I keep all of my coding decisions in this markdown file and I, and I have Claude code go and check it and we're done. Or, you know, I review all the pull requests myself. I know that I do a good job. The bigger your team is, the more complex this is, and the more you have to actually think about that. Complexity scales non-linearly, and that makes tool assessment much more complex once you get past even just a few developers into the team or multi-team scale. Number three, does the tool align with the workflow in the tech stack? This is complex, but you have to ask yourself, what is the team already using? Are they using cursor? Are they using VS code? Whatever it is, what is the code host? Are we on GitHub? Are we in terminals in some cases? And you have to think about what real workflow compatibility looks like. And I'm going to give you an extra challenge here. You need to think about workflow compatibility outside the engineering team. 
which circles back to my second question around engineering practices. Assume you are living in a world, especially if you are sub enterprise level, where people who are not traditional engineers will have code related ideas and potentially code related prototypes they want to push into the code stream in some fashion, maybe not to production, maybe an engineer has to review it, but there are companies who are above single founder level with teams where non-coders are submitting pull requests thanks to their use of a coding agent. Do you have strong enough engineering practices to sustain in that world? Do you have tools that enable people who would not normally have production commit permissions to still be able to do some degree of coding work and pass it to an engineering architect. As far as I know, there is no true plug and play in that world. You have to look at your unique fingerprint and you have to decide what is the tool stack that is gonna be compatible. I think one of the things I wanna call out here that was notable to me as I was reviewing Codex and Claude Code is that Codex seems to implicitly presume a center of gravity around a larger team. So much of Codex is around, and I automatically review the PRs that are getting submitted for my code, right? Can, Codex is already there, it can go in, it can look in GitHub, it can review the PRs, it can write up reviews, et cetera. It can even go and fix and address issues. Whereas Claude Code is more predicated around the idea that you are working in the terminal and you are building end to end and you may be fixing issues and you may be working on things besides code. It's not that one is good and one is bad, it's that their focus is different in the ecosystem and you have to think about where the leverage lies. Because it's absolutely true that if you wanted Claude Code to review your PRs, you can do it. People have, have done it all the time. Single builders, similarly, use Codex all the time. I know some that swear by it. And so it's not that one tool is perfect for any use case, it's that you have to think about what works for you, not just from a model power perspective or from a congruence to prompt perspective or from a degree of comfort with the model or even from a token burn perspective. You have to think about it from an ecosystem perspective. How does it fit? Number four, do you know how you're going to measure success? Do you know how you're going to track changes that happen in the code base? What metrics matter to you? Do you have metrics that are sort of vanity metrics where you're like, oh yeah, we're going to have so many commits and that's going to be the way we do it. Or it's lines of code. We're going to brag to the CTO about the number of lines of code that are AI written. And the CTO is going to write this up into a summary and the CEO is going to tweet it out, which by the way, that totally happens. Is that really a metric or is that a vanity metric, right? Just, just having lines of code is something that any engineer will tell you is a terrible metric for actual productivity. So think about how you want to measure value. One of the horror stories, and I don't say this to scare you, but I say this to warn you, it is certainly possible to think you made these decisions well, but to not really factor in the ongoing impact of what I will call LLM cruft over time. And so what I mean by that is the LLM is pretty good. The LLM understands your code base. You think your engineering infrastructure is up to the challenge, but you don't have ongoing rhythms that have the whole team checking and reviewing LLM coding so that everybody knows what's going on. Everybody is conforming to best practices. The LLM isn't drifting on its own. And what you end up finding is that over time, you spend more and more and more and more of the engineering manager's time or the founder's time reviewing what the LLM submitted. And they get less and less time for leadership, for strategic thinking, because at the end of the day, the code base is more and more and more difficult to understand because the LLM has made effectively unintentional architectural decisions that someone else has to disentangle. And so my, my advice for you is more eyes are better than not, right? If you are in a position where you have multiple eyes and you're building with multiple people, put those eyes and have everybody's expectation be that AI code doesn't go to prod unless someone looks at it and can say, yes, this is architecturally correct. Yes, this actually works. That's not always the case. There are lots of people who say, you know what? We don't do that. We believe it works. That's fine. And maybe in a few cases you are so buttoned up and you are so clean and everything is so well documented and it's so perfect on your small team, you can get away with that. But I'm not here for those perfect one percenters. I'm here for everybody else who lives in the reality of partial documentation and everybody doing their best and everybody trying to meet their deadlines and everybody trying to code according to the new best practices and sometimes forgetting, okay, fine. You should be in a place where you can actually institute engineering practices that sustain the benefits of LLMs by having regular reviews of the code base and regular reviews of LLM performance. That's what I mean by, can you measure success? Can you actually track changes over time? Number five, is security and data privacy thought through carefully here? 
Do you feel comfortable with the terms of service your vendor's offering, the model maker's offering? Are you okay? Have, have you checked for IP leaks, vulnerabilities in generated code, appliance issues, liability generated by that code if it has a mistake in it? You will need a much higher bar on both QA and production code to successfully have agents in play. So yes, they can write code much faster. There are security researchers who will tell me that's just a way of manufacturing vulnerabilities much faster, right? And yes, some of them will also catch vulnerabilities. And that is actually one of the things that OpenAI called out about Codex is that it's good at catching vulnerabilities in code and that OpenAI themselves use Codex as part of their QA process before going to production. So I'm not here to tell you that Codex and Cloud Code don't add value. These two companies are dogfooding their own product and they are finding ways to get value out of it. But I am here to point out that they're not silver bullets. And that if we want to have a deep dive on Codex, we got to talk about some of these engineering infrastructure practices first. Number six, do you actually have buy-in? Again, bigger companies, nonlinear problem spaces, this is going to be harder. If you have junior engineers and senior engineers and principals, and maybe you have some, some non-technical people like I talked about, how are you planning for education on prompting? How are you planning for reviewing your AI outputs? How are you planning for understanding what learning use looks like for juniors? So juniors understand how code actually works and how system components go together and they don't end up over deferring to AI. How do you budget for the resources, the money, also the time to actually learn this and not just get into the temptation of set it and forget it? Because these tools are temptingly easy to set and forget. You can just tell them to do things and maybe the cost doesn't come due today, right? Maybe the bill comes due in six months. You have to be disciplined to do it today. Number seven, what is the total cost beyond pricing? So you have to look at setup. You have to look at maintenance. You have to look at context engineering costs. You have to look at fixes for bad outputs. It is worth it if you have a big team to do a pilot for this because you can actually see over two or three months for this individual two pizza team, for this small team, what did the value look like? And that is exactly the pattern we see in a lot of enterprises is that they will roll this out for a small group, test it, gather learnings, and then figure out how that larger pathway will go. Again, if you're a small team, it's super easy to turn around. It's a two-way door. You try Codex today, you say, oh, it feels better. You dump Cloud Code. You try Cloud Code tomorrow when they release something new, you say, oh, it feels better. You dump Codex. It is not as easy when you're on a bigger team. It doesn't work that way. Okay, we've talked about some of the foundational questions to ask when you are getting set up. I also am aware, looking at the pull requests, looking at the Reddits, so many of you already use an AI coding assistant. And so the second part of this is really going to be asking, what are the questions you need to address as a current user of a coding assistant to figure out if AI is actually helping you or hurting you and how you can troubleshoot that and make the most of your current AI coding assistant implementation. And just like the first seven, we're gonna go through seven and you're gonna to start to see a mapping there. I'm, I'm deliberately creating a doubling effect here so that you can see how this maps from pre-implementation into implementation. Number one, is the AI amplifying inconsistencies in the code base? This maps right back to the idea of having a consistent infra layer, doesn't it? You need to check and see if there are anti-patterns in the suggestions that are persistent. You need to audit and say, if you have outputs that go wrong, do they skew? Do they go wrong in a particular direction? Do you need to fine tune your document standards in a particular way so that the anti-patterns disappear? That's on you. You need to check that. Number two, are you reviewing and testing AI output? I talked about that as something you need to be ready to do, but are you actually doing? Are you actually skipping the explanations? Are you skipping the edge case test that it's recommending? Are you just saying, explain yourself and you're saying, well, that's documentation and that's good enough. Do you feel like you can own the AI output from your AI coding assistant? That's really the standard. If you can stand behind it and say, this code is mine, okay, fair enough. But not everybody does that. Number three, is prompting or context an issue for you as you start to drive coding assistance forward? If you have vague prompts and you're getting vague code, 
does your team have clear specs? Does your team have design docs? Does your team have examples? You see how this goes right back to the infra layer? You can actually diagnose this by testing small incremental changes against small incremental changes in your code base, right? You can change the documentation, you can change the prompt, and you can see if the code base gets better. And you can start to figure out where your test cases are that you need to fix for your infrastructure layer. So this is actually something where you can pinpoint a fix if you're deliberate. Number four, are errors due to tool limitations that you have? Is your tool infrastructure actually thought through? Do you have model weaknesses? One of the things that Codex emphasized is that that they understand the non-linearity of coding problems, that some coding problems need very token efficient surgical changes, and some coding problems need very agentic long form changes, and they produce some metrics to say they're better at it. You know, your mileage may vary. You'll have to see if you agree with them. But the point is, does the tool match the setup? Do you have a setup that allows you to switch models if you need to? Do you have a setup that allows you to understand the size of code base you actually have or a particular niche domain or a particular niche language that you actually have. An example of that is uh, Claude Code and COBOL. Try it out sometime if you're a COBOL person. See, it, see what you think. Number five, how is team usage? Are your teams getting better at engineering? Are your non engineers learning engineering practices? How often do you catch each other in changes made before production so that you actually didn't break something versus how often do you catch things after production and you wonder what happened? How often do you have common newbie mistakes and do they keep getting repeated? How often are people copy pasting without understanding? How often are people not really giving thoughtful feedback to the tool? There's a team culture thing here that it's really up to leadership to reinforce. Number six, are you measuring what matters and can you track it and show that you're actually delivering value? I, I am here to suggest that there are two key pieces to this. One is tying what engineering is doing to real business use cases that matter, business projects that matter, revenue, cost efficiencies. I know engineers get nervous about that, but you have to have stakes in the game. The other is making sure that your leading edge indicators are solid. Do you understand what LLM latency looks like if you have something that's in production? Do you understand how that you are testing for edge cases and how those edge cases actually manifest in production from LLM? Do you understand how to show that your documentation is clean enough and to run evals on your code performance so you can say, yeah, the, the code prompt to code quality is very high. We have human evaluators that say that, and we also have some automated evals that will actually say, you know, the number of PR comments is going down, the quality of PRs is going up, the number of bugs that we've seen in production is going down, like you have some concrete things you can point to. And number seven, if failures persist, is the issue that your preparation was inadequate, which means going back to the beginning of this video and dump, jumping right in, or do you have something fundamental in your stack? Maybe you need to think about how you implement the code base context. Maybe you have to have an agentic search approach where you're searching through the context, maybe the rag is not the right approach for you. Whatever it is, think about a disciplined audit before you assume you blame AI. Undisciplined teams blame AI because it's cheaper and easier. Disciplined teams root cause specific problems and actually get value. These are the things that I have to say over and over again when people want to rush in and say, the Codex news dropped. Nate, the Codex news dropped. What do I do with Codex? Well, this is what I say. Have you had these infrastructure conversations first? Please have these infrastructure conversations. They matter. They help you build what matters. These are the conversations that you have to put in place so that when AI amplifies all of the practices you actually do on a daily basis, not the ones you dream about, well, now that, that you have these practices in place, maybe it will amplify good stuff, not bad stuff. Maybe it will actually help you go faster, not slower. Maybe it will help you deliver more quality code, not break things. You get the idea. The infrastructure matters. Take these questions seriously. Take them as the initial gate that you have to get through before it makes sense to have complicated conversations about which tool to choose. We will do a deep dive on Codex another day.